right, everybody, welcome to another webinar here at Route Consultant. Uh, if you have never met me before or never been to one of these before, my name is Josh Gregory. I lead a few of our different teams here working with both current contractors to help them improve their business, learn about the best ways to optimize what they've already got. And I also work with all of our new investors or buyers as they're looking to get into the space for the first time, figure out if this is the right industry for them. So hopefully we can answer any questions you guys have today. And before I get too far, I do have to read a quick disclaimer as I do every week. So Route Consultant is not endorsed by and is not recommended by Federal Express Corporation, Corporation FedEx Ground, or Amazon. Route Consultant is not sponsored by, is not approved by, is not associated with, and has no connection whatsoever with FedEx, with Federal Express Corporation, FedEx Ground, or Amazon. So uh, all that to say, we still want this to be a place where everyone can come together, ask any questions they have, and hopefully learn a little bit, because the format of today is we will go through some content, some things that I want to update everybody on today. And then we will also open this up for a pure Q&A, where we are going to answer any questions you all bring to us. So at the end of today, there will be a Q&A. And as I'm talking today, you can go ahead and input your questions, or you can save it till we open up for Q&A. But no matter what, when you're typing those in, make sure you put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your window. If you put it into the chat window, I will miss it. So make sure you put it in the Q&A at the bottom if you want me to answer those questions a little bit later. Okay. So the content for today, now, a few weeks ago, we talked in depth on what peak season looks like for pickup and delivery. And we brought on Marlon Campbell as a current contractor to talk through that peak season ramp time, everything to think about. Now, if you want to go back and watch that and, and go see that content, it is on our YouTube channel. But today, what we wanted to do is look at it from another angle, uh, which is instead of pickup and delivery, we want to talk through it on the line haul side. Uh, and, and it's very different than pickup and delivery. So it is a, a separate conversation entirely. So I have brought on Tom Klein to give his perspective and insight today. So there you are. Hey, Tom, how you doing? Doing great. All right. We got the technology working. I can I can hear you. It's perfect. So Tom, if you just want to give a little intro before we jump into it on kind of who you are and where you guys operate out of. Yeah, I'm Tom Klein, as Josh said. Uh, I run TBJ Trucking. We're at a two domiciles right now, Texarkana, which if you're not familiar, it's a small station right where Texas meets Arkansas meets Louisiana. So kind yeah. of tri-state area, if you will. Uh, and then we fairly recently stood up a new operation in Hagerstown, Maryland. So a much bigger hub, East Coast, very different environment, uh, very different system design up there. So we're learning a little bit of uh, the diversity of the FedEx network for sure. But we've been at it about two years now. Uh, our business has been around long before us. We purchased our business through Route Consultants. We've grown it a bit since then, uh, obviously expanding to new locations, but uh, we are excited for hopefully more of a peak this year than last and uh, still learning as well. Every day learning new things. Yeah, and, and we'll talk kind of about how peak season looked last year versus this year a little bit later. Uh, yeah, and you're about you're you're up in Hagerstown now, so you're also going to experience a little bit different weather <laughs> come this peak yeah. season than what you see out in Texarkana. So that's always fun to deal with on the line haul side too. Uh, snows, you know, there remarkably line haul, you know, with how heavy those vehicles are, they're still pretty safe in the snow, but still. Uh, you know, blizzards can still make the days exciting. So sure. get ready for that at the end of this year. Yeah. So um, just kind of at a general level. So we're in kind of the, the ramp up time for peak season right now. So how are you thinking about planning for it? You know, what kind of resources or tools are you looking at to help figure out how many resources you want to add to the business? How, how you want to prepare for peak season right now? Yeah, so Maine, the bulk of our business there in Texarkana and being at a station, you know, we're kind of getting our, I don't want to say marching orders, but uh, <laughs> requests for resources from sort of each of the main places that we go to. So, and they're each on a different schedule. You know, everybody does their own thing. So we got the information from Dallas a couple of weeks ago and they told us, you know, we'd like to see this many more on weekends essentially 
maybe bringing back some things that had gone away over the course of the past year and then adding on top of that all throughout the week they want to see extra for us it's like right on the edge of where we could probably make we'll make it happen with the trucks we have there uh it'll be a stretch you know we could probably justify another one truck maybe even two there to be safe with some of the age of our fleet but you know given the experience last year and some sort of lingering uncertainty macro wise i am confident peak is going to be pretty big i think all indicators are i'm not as solid on my like six months after that and that's the reason i'm not going out to buy four new trucks and try and take every little bit of peak that i can because then i'll still have four trucks for the six months after that and i don't know what that looks like yet but truck wise uh, with the orders we've received so far for peak season uh we should be able to do it driver wise we are hiring more people uh, you know, it is a combination of getting more out of our current guys. You know, we got a lot of guys who are working uh, three days who are going to work five. We got guys working five who are going to work six, stuff like that. And I think they're generally excited about it. I mean, they want that extra work uh, during holiday season, you know, more money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I think there's a really important distinction there that you talked about already, which is you know, pick them and delivery, your, your peak, your, your kind of projections are all coming from your terminal manager. Whereas line hall, you know, you're thinking about the different places and different points in the network that are asking for additional resources. Now, now I know you said you've at, you're at your limit. Have you had any conversations or have, have you talked or considered saying no to anything yet? So not yet. Um, you know, I might even go the other way. Uh, if, so we go to Dallas, we go to Houston, we go to Memphis, Olive Branch, Little Rock, kind of all throughout there. We've really received Dallas's request. I don't really expect much from Houston, but if, say, Memphis came to me and said, you know, we want an extra truck every single day of the week, that's one where I, I probably would evaluate it differently because part of the calculus for me is, you know, I'm still not 100% sure that that's a run that would persist after peak. But if it did, that is worth more to me than if a Dallas run were to persist. So I'm thinking a little bit differently about those requests, um, just kind of on what's valuable to me in the long run, right? Yeah, yeah. And and that is a, a very different thought process and conversation than B&D. Speaking of delivery, it is, you know, trying to balance between what Terminal says and what you really think is going to happen and just trying to allocate those resources. But line hall, you know, those aren't contracted runs that you have. So you have the ability to say no or to kind of limit where you're going to put that volume. And so a lot of it is, is just like you're saying, the calculus and the thought process of where, if I'm going to invest extra is worth the most to me in the long run. And I think that's an important thing for people to hear and be thinking about is more, of, instead of just a, you know, Peak season's coming, there's extra volume. Let me just dedicate as many resources as I can is thinking about how far those dollars go afterwards and what kinds of footholds you can set up at these terminals to set you up for the next couple of years. Right. And so I, I think that's really important to, to kind of think through on this side. Now, you mentioned it a little bit. Now, if we're thinking about drivers, right now you're, you know, you're trying to think through adding drivers. Do you pitch it as, hey, you know, we just need you for a month? Do you talk about it as a full-time job? What's the the market for that look like right now? I'd say with the level we're at now and the amount we're looking to add, I'm talking about it as a full-time job. Uh, and I I mean it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not selling anybody a bill of goods there. I, I feel like uh, that is the intention is uh, between, you know, there's natural turnover in the business we've been really really lucky we got a great team now uh, when we took over the business you know we were running at a hundred percent annualized turnover <laughs> so if you were going into uh and at the time we had 12 drivers so it was almost perfectly one a month we were losing so going into peak you could hire three extra people and expect to stair step your way back down to even mm -hmm. without any intervention Luckily, now we've got a much stickier workforce. You know, we've got the crew we like. 
So we are, I'd say, a little bit more careful about who we're adding, but the intention is for them to be full time. Now, again, if we get requests from new destinations that change the calculus there, then I would be talking to people more part time. But the thing I would do first probably is try to get more out of the current part timers that I have. I have three guys right now who do less than a full load. They do one of them does one day, one of them does two or three, and the other does three or four. So that's a lot of slack capacity. If I can ask them for a month at a time or two weeks on, two weeks off, kind of rotate the load through, I can get an extra theoretical 10 runs out of those guys, right, if they want to do it. And that's a better situation for our morale and whatever yeah. to kind of hook those guys up rather than bring on true temps. Yeah, and that's fair. And I think that's an, another important point. Sometimes the line haul extra peak volume is not additional runs. It's just it's a four-day run that turns into a six-day run during, during yeah. peak. Season. So yeah, as much as you can flex the guys, and especially the part-timers, there's value in that. And it, it's also, you know, it's very hard to keep a driver on who's only doing one day. You know, that's that's not what most line haul drivers are thinking about this space for. They're viewing it as a career. You're not going to have a bunch of people who are like, yeah, you know, call me when you need me. I'm, I'm just not going to work in the meantime. Yeah. Uh, so three or four is about the the most partial you can get. Or, you know, P&D, you've got people who are who will literally tell you, I will work for the next month. That's the only time I have for it. And, you know, maybe I will only work one day a week. I'm a, you know, 24 hours on, 48 hours off type job. Uh, so line haul, you one, you you always want to get people that when you can get them, but know that if you bring them in and there's nothing for them, you're going to lose them. So you kind of have to play that game there. And, and so when you're thinking about the people that you bring in, or even your normal people, uh, do you do any extra kind of incentive during peak to get them to do more, or is it just basically you're doing more so you get paid more? Yeah, it's mostly doing more, getting paid more. Uh, you know. Hey. In our Maryland operation, it's a little bit different mindset. You know, Texas, everything's bigger in Texas. These guys are running a lot of miles and they're all assigned runs. So these guys know they're getting enough miles each day. They're kind of paid on a per mile basis. And so doing an extra day gets them that much more money. In Maryland, uh, you know, they tend to be shorter runs, shorter segments. So we have more of a guaranteed minimum set up there. Uh, and peak, I think will really offer the opportunity to get really above that guaranteed minimum and make great money beyond that. So I think it's a different incentive structure there, but it's a different setup. And I think we're pretty well aligned on that front. And, you know, we try to treat our people well through the holidays. If they're working holidays, I mean, you pay them extra if you know, it gets a little bonus and stuff like that, just typical holiday stuff, but I'm not fundamentally changing the way that we pay during peak. Yeah. And I'd say that's, you know, that's, that's correct. I mean, if you, you think about it, um, pick up and delivery, there's incentives people offer to try to get that sixth day or to get more hours out of them with that assumption. Cause you know, not everybody, not many people are paying hours uh, are paying hourly on the PND side, but um, you know, line haul drivers, the runs are already pretty long. Uh, there's only so many hours they can do in a row and there's only so many hours they can do in a week. So um, there's only so much you can pay for anyway. So it's kind of just, if you're doing more, you get paid more. And then I think everybody has those types of holiday incentives or things you'll do at the end of the year for people. Now, uh, this is, you know, it ties a little bit into line hall in general, but as you're bringing these people in and you're trying to get them up to speed quickly, is there anything you do to, to accelerate that onboarding and training? Or is it more of just, you know, I kind of know my system and I get them in at the right time and get them on the road when I need to. Yeah, I think the most important thing, peak or not, is being careful about who you bring on. You know, we have a really good situation in Texarkana. We got, like I said, a stable crew who know people. We operate 100% on referrals there. And if I can take a person, get them fully compliant, put them in the truck with a guy they already know and like for two days, they're ready to go. I trust them, right? And I can have someone vouch for their safety. That's a great situation. Maryland's a little different, right? Especially as we're going from zero to one, trying to get our first crew on. And, um, you know, we've had fits and starts there. Uh, I would say have fallen in the trap of just get anybody in there. 
Yeah. And uh, that cost more than it's worth probably. So I would say just number one, regardless if it's peak and you feel the pressure or not, be careful about who you're hiring. Uh, I want to say be fast to fire, but if it's safety related, be fast to fire. You know, yeah. um, there's no amount of extra peak miles that are worth incidents of any kind. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the biggest thing is that, you know, even if you lose that, let's say that driver makes a mistake, you fire him. Sure. That driver's done, but those mistakes, those safety things live with you and live with your contract. And that's still a conversation you have to have with FedEx. So uh, that, I think that's a really good point is that even though these guys are CDL trained, they've got more training than if you're thinking about PND, but they still must make mistakes and you can still have issues if you're rushing people in. Not all CDLs are created equal and, and not all drivers are perfectly trained and ready to go just because they came out of CDL school. So right. find that out painfully sometimes. <laughs> um, now, uh, when you're thinking, we, we, you know, we talked about drivers, so let's, let's thank fleet. I think, I know you've kind of talked a little bit about the calculus you make about where would I maybe have more, you know, a more of a permanent run after the peak season. But so does that mean that you're doing rentals? How do you think about adding vehicles as needed? So personally and where we're at right now fleet strategy wise we've got some aging trucks mm -hmm. and it's kind of like what i was saying when you've got employee turnover you can go up and expect to naturally come back down so that's probably how i think about trucks right now i would buy uh expecting that in time not too much time we're going to be rolling off some of our existing trucks so it'll kind of sort itself out you know, I haven't tried to tap the rental market recently. You can tell me, is it still as crazy as the last time I did that? <laughs> it's, uh, it's probably similar to the last time you did that. Yeah, so, so that would just be a mess. Uh, but I have seen prices come down a good bit on, you know, resale trucks. And I feel like there's some pretty good value out there on those right now. So I'm a buyer. I'm a buyer right now. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it, are you buying used, new? Have you, what used. Where's yeah. I mean, my goal is get something with half its economic life left, pay less than half of its original price and understand that you're buying probably the more maintenance intensive part of its life. But you got to trade those off. But on a cash flow situation, get the yeah. depreciation, whatever, I think it just works out well to buy relatively low mile. You know, I bought anywhere in a range of 100,000 miles, 400,000 miles, not not really beyond that. Yeah. I had someone pitch me a 800,000 mile truck the other day. I said, no, thank you. I got plenty of those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm trying to get rid of and put on yeah. the spare. Yeah. I don't need more of those. Yeah. Um, perfect. So uh, we touched on it a little bit, how you're getting orders from different, you know, places that you dispatch to. Have you considered or looked into in the past or this year, reaching out proactively to places that you may want more out of? Yeah. We don't do it enough. We're not as good at it as we should be. You know, uh, the whole hustling for business is something that I need to get better at and make more calls, cold calls, show up places. You know, I understand that's an option. I can just show up at a place. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't do enough of that. And I'll maybe take this peak season opportunity to try to do more of it because however well met people think their needs are probably going into this, I expect someone will be in crisis. So if I can be there with the truck, I can probably help somebody out, even on just one of the destinations we're going to. Uh, yeah, and, and sometimes just offering the hand, even if you don't get anything out of it in the short term or this peak season, sets up that relationship and they remember you when they do need you. So yeah, yeah. It, yeah some of it is that you're getting, you know, you're getting, you may be getting more orders than you can even handle from your different destinations. So when it's at a time like that, it's like, you know, I got to decide which one's, I'm taking it from the people I'm already dealing with, but uh, there comes a time too, where it's like when you're starting to think about, you know, maybe there is a a, a state or a destination that you want to head to next. That's when you kind of start to do be proactive and, and peaks always a time for it. Cause it's when people are looking for help. Yeah. And just touching on that point, big picture, I think maybe especially in the line hall space, some of us, myself included at times kind of, I don't want to say transactionalize, but, discount the value of we're business partners here right if you can help someone out get their uh tasks accomplished right 
I won't say they don't owe you a favor. No one owes you anything, but you're a resource to that person. Right. And they're going to thank you in the future. And, uh, you know, it's easy to think of ourselves as just receiving our little settlement statements. we deal with big FedEx, but there's real people involved. And if you can help someone out in a tough spot, uh, you know, it's got really intangible value. Yeah, for sure. And, and you're right. I mean, it's one of those things where, especially in line hall, lots of guys don't go into the terminal. So it's also easier to feel, to not think about the other people that are a part of it, but uh, it, it, it has real impact both on you when you need help and also on, you know, them when they need help and kind of cementing those symbiotic relationships. Um, okay. So kind of one of the last things here, just, just nuts and bolts. So how does FedEx pay you during peak season? What have you seen there? Yeah. So, you know, going into last peak, uh, I think was right when the six day operation thing happened. So there's a little bit of chaos in, uh, you know, the fundamental thing is your peak incentive threshold, right? You got to do more than this many miles to really make that special money. And, so we had a little bit of chaos in well, our steady state business situation just changed fairly significantly. And I think they did a pretty good job of going back in and revising that number down so that we had realistic goals. But again, it wasn't much of a peak. You know, there's a reason they were cutting those days out in the first place. So we did still see, I don't know, three or four weeks across peak where we uh, exceeded that threshold. And it's it's real money it's uh it's a little chunk of change on top and going back to an earlier point about incentivizing drivers i would say on that sort of stuff because there is some per mile type of upside here at peak i'm not trying to keep 100 percent of that for myself here is gravy right uh i want to make sure if there is that upside i'm not saying it's always there but if there is that upside sharing back through to the drivers a certain percentage of revenue kind of consistent with what they've been getting right it it can be good for all of us so yeah, um, yeah. you probably yeah. talk more about the actual formulas i don't know yeah that, I mean, that's perfect yeah the, the the two parts of the equation for peak season one is what you talked about they're going to set a mileage threshold and going above that threshold you're going to earn extra money and, and i think that's that's the biggest thing people think about it is it is the biggest monetary incentive around peak season uh, it's different, you know, it's different from schedule K on the PND side. It's really just setting that, that threshold. Now, the other side, the other incentive that you get during peak is the points you earn on your tractors can be redistributed at the end of peak, however you want. So let's say over the course of peak season, you earn 200 points across your tractors. You can leave them split up on the tractors that earned it, or you can take that chunk and put it all on one tractor. So depending on you know what points in the bidding system looks like in the terminals you're in, sometimes that can be a way to boost one tractor up by combining the points from across all your tractors. So those are the kind of the two sides of, of peak incentives on line haul, but uh, really it comes down to, can I earn enough miles or take enough runs to get above that threshold and get that extra money? So uh, you touched on it a little bit about how your first peak season last year was pretty slow. One of the things that I think I want to know and is, and is helpful for new entrants to hear is, did the terminal predict that accurately? How much do you have to kind of prepare for and discount or be aware of the, the macro environment compared to what your terminal manager and, and different others in your district are saying? Yeah, for us in our particular terminal, we have a lot of unique uh situation elements of our situation there it's a small terminal we're the only tsp on the terminal yeah. and it's been very steady business for a very long time so while there wasn't upside there also wasn't downside it was what they said it would be they were open about it well in advance they told us you know no need to go out and buy trucks right now <laughs> uh, we're not expecting a lot and there was some, but it was very manageable. So I think it was open. It was honest. It was accurate. Uh, you know, unique situation, though. A lot of factors making it more predictable. Uh, I can only imagine how unpredictable things can get in all sorts of different markets for all sorts of different reasons. Big, small, new, old, what have you. Uh, I think we were really lucky with the predictability, but I wouldn't expect it 
in any markets we enter from here on out. Yeah. And some of that you're just going to feel out because some of it's going to come to how do certain terminal managers communicate and how honest are they? Do they overshoot because they're always worried and always, you know, say that they're going to need more than they actually need because they'd rather you take on that cost than them. So some of that you're going to just feel out every terminal, every area is a little bit different in terms of how they experience things, you know, being the only operator at a terminal is different than being at, you know, at a hub where there's a ton of different contractors. And so it's a little bit harder to perfectly predict what the volume will look like. Um, but just know that's always a part of the, the calculus, the game that you're playing leading up to peak season. It's, you know, what are the, what are the different projections I'm getting? Uh, do I fully believe that? Or do I think that how much of that can I cover with what I've already got? And then covering and kind of working through a risk analysis of how much, you know, from a driver and truck perspective that you want to add on top of that to hit whatever FedEx is saying. And then, you know, if you end up in a scenario where you've over-indexed on resources, that's when it also comes back to having those relationships to reach out to and be proactive and say, you know, I got an extra truck and driver. I'm sure somebody in this district needs help. <laughs> so um, as much as you can, beyond just the actual terminal um, staff that you can interact with, if you can get relationships with the, at the district level as well, that can be a huge help when you're trying to say, I got extra resources, tell me anyone in the district who needs it and I'll send it. Those types of things are really valuable. So um, that's what that's what Pete comes down to. It's, it's, it's not the same pressure as pickup and delivery because you're not required to deal with every single bit of volume. But there's a lot of different moving parts that you can take advantage of to be really successful during peak season. So um, that's the main things we wanted to talk about and cover on the peak side today. Um, and so in just a second, uh, we're going to open it up to Q&A. But uh, before that, I'm going to give some quick new listings and events that are coming up. And then we're going to get into the Q&A. So as I'm going through this, if you have more questions, we've already got some in the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, make sure you uh, go ahead and type those in and then Tom and I'll get to those in just a second. So uh, inventory wise, a few new listings or a few listings to highlight here. The, the first one is out of Idaho. It is 10 PND routes at 780K. Uh, this one's 19% margin manager, low mileage territory. Uh, and it's got 23 trucks, plenty of spares if you need it for that. Uh, next one is uh, another one in, out of Idaho, six PND routes at four hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. This one has a manager, sixteen percent margin, six trucks, uh, higher mileage CSA uh, makes it a lot easier on the drivers. There's less stops and less of the physical manual labor they have to do there. Uh, next one is also out of Idaho, uh, five PND routes, three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, fifteen percent margin, low mileage territory, six trucks and a and a spare as well. Next one we have out of Florida, it is 27 routes, 4.5 million. Uh, and this is 29% margin. So a really profitable operation, beachfront state, two managers, 36 trucks, lots of spares there, and it does not operate on Sundays. So that's a, a large one out of Florida if you're looking for that type of operation on the PND side. Uh, next one's out of New Hampshire. It is 11 routes at 1.325 million. 21% uh, margin, manager, 20 trucks, lots of spares. And again, also does not operate on Sundays. Uh, also got um, next one here out of Florida. Again, 20 routes at 1.45 million. 15% uh, margin, two managers, 21 trucks. Um, and it, this comes from a contractor with uh, over 17 years of experience. Next one out of South Carolina, 11 P&D routes at 1.25 million. Uh, one manager, 15 trucks with four spares. Uh, really strong relations with the terminal and also has a strong AVP program if that's something that you're trying to get into. Uh, last one here is out of Virginia. It is seven routes at $750,000, 20% margin, manager, 12 trucks, uh, and it is also only operating six days a week. So those are the new listings. Let me jump into a couple of new events that are coming up. Uh, if you have never been to one of our new investor summits, those are designed to teach you everything we possibly can in two days, and you will see a lot of me. So if you're looking to meet me in person, instead of just me talking to a, a screen and not getting to see you, we'll have those. Uh, it's FedEx and Line Hall, and it's, it's like I said, it's designed to just 
pump you full of every bit of information we can with the goal that at the end of that, you'll know whether the FedEx space is the right industry for you or not. And so, you know, if it's not, great, you've saved time and money, you can move on to something else. And if it is, then this is a way to kind of engage and, and jumpstart that process from there. And so we have our next one, it's in Nashville, uh, and it's on October 9th and 10th, so in a couple of weeks here. Uh, also, we will be out on the West Coast in Phoenix on October 18th. So if you are in the area, we're going to have a happy hour, completely free to attend. We'll have food, we'll have drinks, it'll be contractors and investors in the area. Uh, so if you're looking to network in the area or just meet our team, we will be there on October 18th. And the last one I always want to mention is next year, it, we're, our expo is already open. It's it's in Dallas, so you can go ahead, reserve your room, reserve your hotel. It's going to be a little bit closer for you, Tom, than, than it was last year to make that trip to Dallas. It's going to be a little bit easier than uh, coming out to Vegas. But um, you can already register. That hotel block is open and it will sell out. So if you're interested in getting the discounted hotel uh, rooms, at the it's at the Gaylord in Dallas. Okay. So those are the new uh, events and listings. I'm gonna jump into the questions. Like I said, as I'm going through these, if you have any additional questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. So I will start with this one here from Jim. So he's heard in the past that payroll should be 40, between 42% and 52% of sales. Now, uh, to clarify, I would assume you're talking about P&D, pickup and delivery here, Jim. Um, his question is that, does that include all taxes and workers, workers comp insurance? So. A uh, couple of questions here I'll refer, I'll, I'll kind of go through it. So um, that is a range you can look at for payroll, but I, I would more so say 45 to 55 from what I've seen recently. Um, if you can be in the 40s, that's better, uh, obviously, than, than the upper 50s. Um, now, the what we're pointing to there is drivers and managers. Uh, that does not include payroll tax. It does not include workers' comp. Those are separate line items when we're talking about those ranges. So um, the closer you can be to the mid 40s, mid to high 40s, the better. Um, but that range is a little bit higher than what you may have seen in the past, just from inflation and the things we've seen over the past couple of years. But that does not include payroll tax. It does not include workers' comp. Um, all right, next one here from Mark. This one's for you, Tom. So, um, how can you screen for an unsafe driver? during the interview process? How, how, what do you do to try to find out if this person is safe or one you can bring in and how early can you do it? Yeah, I think there's things you can do. There's no perfect answer, which is why you gotta be willing to fire fast, right? You learn a lot in those first three days, that first week of lytics videos and whatnot as they come in. So there's some things you can't know till you know, but I think you can get a sense for just, you know, have more than a five minute conversation with a driver and you can hear about their history and how they think about driving. You know, if they take it more seriously as a lifelong career, there's a lot of guys who are so proud of their safety record. They'll tell you how many safe miles they got. You know, obviously there aren't enough of those guys to fill <laughs> all the spots we need to fill uh, as much as I wish there were, but I'd say you can tell when someone puts a premium on safety. And I think that that has a real effect on their behaviors. Uh, on the downside, no, sometimes people will sheepishly tell you, well, I got fired for an incident at this place. And then you got to evaluate, you know, uh, was it a big deal? Have they gotten better? Are they likely to do it again? And I'll tell you, I get in this trap all the time. We got spots we need to fill. It's easy to say, I'm sure they're better now. Uh, but, you know, yeah, you should be it's, more skeptical if you can, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's always tough, you know, but I think you're right. There's there's questions you can ask and, and you can get a feeling for how passionate they are about certain aspects of the job, career, safety, all of those types of things. But you're right. There's there's a certain amount that you have to take kind of on faith based on their records and based on what you heard. And it is crucial that in those first few days and weeks that you are locked into better. Um, that's when you will be able to see those habits. You'll be able to see what they're doing when no one's around. Even though there's a camera in there, you'd be surprised that people, <laughs> the things people do, uh, knowing that they are being recorded and knowing that those habits are 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 monitored. Um, so as, as soon as you can, you know, early on in the process, you track those and they may not be an immediate hireable or fireable offense, 
but it may be something that you give coaching on. And if you see zero changes, like, you know, you coach on it one day and the next day they're doing it again and you're seeing that pattern, then, then Tom's right. The, even though they may not have done something yet to, you know, cause a major accident, they are on the, they are the type of driver that is making those mistakes and unwilling to correct it. And you're better off firing them sooner rather than later. And, and, it, and he's right. The, the trap is trying to hold on to someone who, you know, is a bad fit and you know is going to cause you a problem and you're just hoping that that problem doesn't happen um and and it will uh it's not an if it's a win when you've identified those and the other trap you can get into is when they do have a mistake you know they have an accident and trying to hold on to them and make excuses accepting their excuses for why that happened um a lot of time you know it, Drivers that have had an accident are significantly more likely to have a second accident. So it is a pattern where unless unless you you really do have a ton of faith in them and you know that they're, you know, is a is a one off blip. A lot of times those serious accidents, those serious things that happen uh, are indicating a pattern that you need to listen to and move on quickly. Um, all right. So next one here is from Hale. So as someone looking at purchasing line haul routes before the end of this year, how do we think about this year's peak? Are we past the point where you could close a deal and take over? And if not, how do you go about planning for peak and managing it um, while working with a seller? So um, now, Tom, you guys did not take over during peak season, did you? It was that it was. At the no, we were like February 1st. Yep. So uh, the intention originally, I think, was to uh, do like December 31st or something, which would have been at the tail end of a problem, but probably still a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what I would say is you are not too late in the year to close on line hall. You can still close. There's not the same um, kind of blocks that, that FedEx will do on the PND side where into November and December, it's essentially impossible to close on a PND. We've done it, but just don't expect it. Uh, line hall, it can still happen. Um, it is something where you can take over at that time of year because of all the things we've talked about earlier where there aren't the same pressures. You're not, you know, you don't contractually have to do a bunch of extra volume. So it can be a little bit easier. So they'll allow more of that takeover during the end of the year. Now, what I will say is no matter what, if you're taking, even if you're taking over in the middle of the year, uh, you need to make sure you understand what volume looks like right now. And if the seller has had to staff up or if, you know, are you taking over at the end of the year and the seller knows that there's peak season coming and they haven't done anything to prepare for. And they're just hoping that you take over and that they get to avoid that. So it, it is really important that you have set up a working relationship with the seller and know what they've done. If they are taking on additional volume for peak season, have they brought on those drivers or tractors or whatever they need to cover that volume? And it also comes in why, you know, transition support should be built into the contract. Seller financing is often you know, a thing we encourage on all of these deals because it helps give a little, uh, you know, a little bit for that seller to want to make sure you're successful because they want you to pay them back over time on that seller financing. So it helps give a little bit of financial incentive on that transition support. So the the, the long and the short of it, Hale, is that um, I don't think you are too late, but just know that these are the, these are potentially the busiest months of the year. So as you're looking to close, it is just like you said, really important to make sure you're in lockstep on at all of the recruiting and fleet changes that your seller may be making so that you can walk in and know what has changed and that you're prepared for it. If I could add anything to that, it would just be ask yourself, why, why do you have a deadline on acquiring and don't push for anything that's going to be a bad idea, you know? There's yeah. probably not any real reason you need to get this done by December 31st, 2023. So you're, I mean, Josh is the expert on buying and selling. And I would agree you're not too late yet, but if you get to a point where you think you might be, don't push the envelope on your entry because that's your reputation for quite a while after that. And uh, you know, if, if it's, you're looking for an income, it's better to pay yourself out of savings than, rush into something that you shouldn't do because you have an arbitrary deadline. But yeah. that's just my two cents. Be no, that's right. Eyes yeah, wide yeah. open. Yeah. Yeah. You want to make sure that it is, it's not an artificial deadline that, you know, there's, there's lots of reasons why a seller has to get out for personal health reasons where, you know, those types of things, maybe they do have to sell by a certain date, but um, if it's just to be this year, you know, January is a pretty slow time. So 
uh, January, February, kind of the early of the year, once you pass the return season. So that can often be a, a, a good time of year to jump in. It, but like I said, if you're trying to take advantage and get the income from peak, you're about to close and you've got, and you know what you're walking into and you understand that deadline, it can work out. Just make sure, like Tom said, eyes wide open on that. Perfect. All right. Um, if we don't see any more questions, I will go ahead and end it. So while I'm doing my 10 second spiel here at the end, uh, on the way out, if anybody gets a question in, I will answer it. Otherwise this will be the end. Uh, so Tom, thank you so much for being here and thank you for answering all the questions being available. Um, and for everyone who's on here today, like I said, this was the line hall side. We've done the PND side of the peak equation that's on YouTube. So if you're looking for those answers, we have it already, but, um, for line hall, we've got Tom here and, and I, I just, again, appreciate you being here and thank you everybody else who's joined. Uh, and again, I mentioned those events. Hopefully if anybody's out in the Phoenix area, I'll get to see you in a couple of weeks. I'm looking forward to it. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me. Yep. All right. Bye.